every town around in New Zealand had a female reporter. And we used to get essentially some of the silliest items you could ever imagine. I can remember dancing around Lampton Quay and Courtney Place trying to get yoghurt out of a milk bottle on Wellington's town and around. In Dunedin's town and around, I was always sent to the cat show. I remember after my father died, the day after the funeral, I had to be at the cat show at half past seven in the morning. The equipment weighed a tonne and it was very jealously guarded, you know, I, and footage, you know, you were in absolute poo street if you shot too much footage uh, because film was considered a, a priority and precious. So that was quite a good discipline because nowadays they just rattle off so much. Uh, it, it fascinates me. And we also edited all our own items and we wrote them and um, I don't think that's quite like that now, but I don't know, maybe it is, don't think so. But some of those women that I worked with were great characters and highly witty, intelligent individuals. And that one that comes to mind is Marama Martin, who I still maintain had the most mellifluous voice ever heard on New Zealand radio or television. She was a wonderful television announcer. The country adored her because she embraced them with this great warmth of personality and, you know, when Judy Bailey became, what is it, the mother of the nation, well, I didn't frankly find her nearly as maternal as that darling Marama occupying your screen. And as anybody who saw Marama knows, she was a very big woman, a very big, generous-spirited creature. And um, she'd never be on television now, because all got to be, what, eight stone, blonde, tall, leggy, and somehow they've all now got big tits suddenly which is quite in contrast to the rest of their bodies. But no, that, that is one of the most unbelievable changes is what is required in appearance now. There was that regular group of Margaret Wilson, Kath Tizard, Shona McFarlane, Jean McLean, Josie Jones. We would shoot every month, three weeks. We weren't all on together, but we would shoot three weeks and one Saturday every month. We were the first group of people, those women, to actually speak publicly about sexual abuse, about um, contraception, adoption, the adoption law reform bill, Fran Wilde was, and the homosexual law reform bill, that had not yet come to pass, but the adoption one. There was a huge battle one day on television. There was Kath and I and Jean McLean, I can't remember who the fourth was, but Jean had two adopted children and she did not want open adoption and it upset her terribly. And Kath and I, of course, were strongly for it, but she drove, I always remember her telling us afterwards, she was so upset she drove to the St. Clair Sandhills and had a cry, because we were such dear friends and we had opposed. A initially, she took it personally, which, of course, wasn't the case at all, and then that soon all. She came round. But, so, a lot of those letters were genuinely asking for serious advice on serious matters. In that 12 years, they did try men, you know, on the panel, but only two. Jeremy Coney, when he was captain of the New Zealand cricket team, and Trevor Plumley, who was off Antiques Roadshow, to need an antique dealer. And um, they, they were fine, but the public didn't want men. Isn't that extraordinary? Because they were very good panellists. They were both very articulate, and Coney, of course, was very witty, as was um, Dear old Trevor, he had a lovely dry wit. He was a genius at timing. There was never, ever, ever was the, um, we've got to cut because we've gone over time. He had a clock in front of him, like a cooking timer, and he'd just keep an eye on that, and you could feel him. And he knew who to throw to, and, and sometimes he wouldn't let them send Shona and I the questions, because he wanted us off the cuff to give it more spontaneity. So he was very much chair, presenter, bar producer in many ways, really. But we had great producers too. Brian Stewart was Dunedin, and there there was lots of fun. We had that wonderful night when um, on the same program were Chris Laidlaw and Bob Jones. It was the day after he had punched Rod Vaughan in the nose in the Tongariro River, when Vaughan irritated him by demanding an interview and wading into what Bob called his water. So, um, yes, he said he'd come on to discuss it. 
And that was the same night Chris Laidlaw was on because he just brought out a book that stroked very, very strongly against lots of things to do with all blacks and all blacks' behaviour and with um, the whole, you know, um, South African issue. But mainly it was to do... So there was a lot of interest in this night because we had the always lugubrious and brilliantly witty Bob. And I've always found him absolutely delightful and hilarious. He's impossible, irascible and... Very clever. And of course, Chris, a very substantial New Zealander from being a diplomat to being captain to being an MP. We had no idea, but um, we were about, we, there were pro right, um, protesters were in the audience. They got in. And the minute Laidlaw came on to go on the screen, they disrupted the whole programme. And so we, we were recording it, of course, which was lucky. But in, that gave Bob time to consume quite a bit of red wine while we reassembled because he could he's the only person I know who could actually seriously have a good few wines and go on television and be even funnier than normal brilliant um, I've never had a glass of wine before I've gone on radio or television I think anybody who does is nuts actually because I've seen the results but um, when, when I remember saying poor old Rod Vaughan I mean that's dreadful what you did to him Bob and he went couldn't have happened to a nicer chap couldn't have happened to a nicer chap. Nothing fazed him. No. To be quite frank and with respect to Jeff, he was a bit past the technology. He couldn't remember anything. So they had, and he couldn't use an auto cue, which I have never used actually. I, none of our lot ever did. But they used to have to write in very large hand all his links. And it was a mutual thing. It wasn't Jeff was sacked. It was, he just, he'd never been on television in that capacity before. And, you know, there's quite a few disciplines, as you can appreciate, required to be doing that sort of thing. And whether you like people or not, you have to be charming to them. 50 Forward was Gordon McLaughlin and I. And that actually was a quaint little program. It was a good program. And it screened at nine o'clock in the morning. And it was very relaxed, incredibly relaxed. And I always remember Holmes one day saying to me, um, I love that programme. And I said, yeah, he, he was at his height. He said, no, I go home for breakfast when I come off air. And I watch 50 Forward. And he said, when people come to me and ask, you know, for training or what to do to get on television, I tell them to watch 50 Forward, to watch you on 50 Forward. Um, so <laughs> that was great fun. And it should have gone on, actually, because there was a... I think our producer lost interest. There was a programme in Australia, Burke's Backyard, that was very similar, really. I can always remember one day Gordon and I were sent to um, Les Mills to do an item on fitness over 50. Well, Gordon still swims, and he doesn't mind telling you he's one of the year of 31, as is Kath, Tizard. So he's swimming every day round Mission Bay. And I do an awful lot of walking, because I've got the crazy dog and I don't drive a car. But... Gyms are an anathema to both Gordon and I, and hence we were sent along to Les Mills, and the smell of the liniment was the first thing that we got, and in the costumes. And I remember getting in there, and here was George Hanare and Andy Anderson, and they were all with their backs to the wall, biking furiously well, with no handles. And we were at the, just had the big power shortage in Auckland, and Gordon just looked up, and not a pause, and went, why don't we attach those buggers to the national grid? It was just delicious.